So this is my June wrap up video and June was Pride Month and you can't really see my shirt but I'll put a picture of it in here. I read books um, concentrating on LGBTQ characters or authors or topics and in my description box below I'm going to list some organizations and or charities uh, or anything of that sort that supports and encourages LGBTQ people and concentrating on youth and young people um, because there's so much need for areas where young people can find support and not just financial but emotional and physical if they need a place to live and um, freedom to be who they are. So I'm going to list some organizations below and hopefully you'll take the time to check them out. Hi Booktube, it's Kim at Kbackers Books and this is my June 2020 wrap up. So like I said in my intro, I concentrate on reading books um, with for Pride Month that contained either LGBTQ characters or were written by LGBTQ authors um, or who addressed any type of subjects or topics that would apply to uh, reading books for Pride Month in June. So let's get going. The first one, I've, I've got one DNF, unfortunately. And the first book I'm gonna show you is a, is a um, carryover from the Asian readathon. And this is Love in a Fallen City by Eileen Chang. It's a short story collection. This one on Goodreads, I gave three stars because it, it's a short story collection. And that's a tough one because short stories or essays or short story collections, not every single one is going to be as good as the other ones. And this one contains seven stories. Two of them I DNF'd. I'm about to sneeze, so hold on. Okay, sneeze over mostly. I'm go I've got allergies going on today. Um, so there were seven short stories. Two I DNF'd, really did not like them at all. A couple I really liked a lot. And then a couple were okay. And so I didn't love the collection. Um, that's about all I can tell you because there was a lot of different topics that were in the collection, in the stories. Um, this Eileen Chang was a writer um, quite a few years ago in the 50s and 60s, I believe. And I wish I wish I was more prepared. Yeah. Um, this collection was copyrighted in 2007, but the stories were copyrighted, copyrighted, <laughs> copyrighted um, in the 40s by the estate of Eileen Chang. So I think a lot of my issues may have been some of the material was quite a bit dated. Um, I just, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy some of the structure, but it was okay. So there's some stories in here I enjoyed. And that was about that for that. Now my DNF. Um, this was unfortunate because I was really looking forward to this book and it's a fantasy, which I really enjoy. And this is a YA fantasy. This is Girls of Paper and Fire by N Natasha Nagan. And it's the first in a series, I think. The second book is out as well. Um, this is a story of Lee, L-E-I, who is a member of the paper cast. It's the lowest class in this particular society. She is a human and there are three casts. The middle cast is the steel cast. It's humans endowed with partial anim animal demon qualities, both in physicality and abilities. And then the highest cast is the moon cast, fully demon with whole animal demon features. Um, and they have particular special powers and that type of thing. The, the general topic is um, Lee is 17 years old. She is a human. She is kidnapped from her home by members of the demon cast to be brought to the king to end up being one of his many concubines. Um, the, there are families in the moon cast who raise their daughters to believe that this is a positive development in their life to be basically given over to the king for sex slavery is, is what it is. But Lee is kidnapped from her home because she has golden eyes that the one of the, the moon cast generals thinks that the king would really enjoy. And so she's kidnapped into sex slavery. The reason I DNF the book is 
I was a little grossed out by the way the author was, the direction the author was going with this topic. I, I really believed that if you're going to write a fictional book about sex slavery, you need to be extremely sensitive about it. And I, I was just kind of alarmed in the direction she was taking it. This is also a lesbian love story and Lee is kidnapped and brought to the palace Within a day, she is dealing with the kidnapping. She's dealing with being ripped away from her father and her home. And within, the, within a day, she's brought at night and the next morning, she is washed and dressed and she is introduced to the other girls who have been brought to the palace to be the king's concubines. And within the first hour, she meets the other girl who she predictably and inevitably will fall in love with. It was almost an instant thing, insta-love type of a thing. And I just did not, uh, <laughs> I did not, I did not find that realistic, plausible. Um, I wanted to read her take on um, the topic of sex slavery. Um, maybe had I gone further into the book, I think I read 75 pages. Maybe if I had gone on and finished the book, there would have been more development about that. The other thing that truly bothered me, and it, it, it happens very quickly. If I get to a point and I read something that with horrible grammar or horrible word choice or description, it, it knocks me out of the sense of the story and it kind of ruins it for me. And there was a point where she was being brought to the castle and they get to the castle walls and they're made of black onyx and they're extremely thick, high walls that are enchanted to protect, protect the castle. And she's describing either the size or the height of trees or the wall or some of the guards, whatever. And the description that the author, the descriptive phrase that the author uses is these ones, these ones were bigger or these ones were taller to quantify the size or the height. And the minute I read that, I'm like, no, you didn't just write, you didn't just describe it as these ones. So I, it knocked me out of the story. The topic um, concerned me, the lack of sensitivity. And ironically, as far as I could read in the background of the author, something, she had survived some sort of trauma in her life. And um, that's why she was kind of directing this story the, the way that she did. I just really did not enjoy it. So that was disappointing. Um, I'm gonna show you the books in the order that I read them. The first one that I read and finished in the last half of June is Hyde by Matthew Griffin. This is a story, a, a love story um, between two men, Wendell and Frank. And Frank is a um, taxidermist. And this is set after World War II. Wendell is a, was a soldier and um, Frank was a taxidermist. Now both men are gay and neither one are out to their families. Frank left his family. Um, actually, that, that's not true. I think Frank, I think they knew that Frank was gay, but he, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure now. <laughs> I don't remember if they knew he was gay or if he just did not feel supported by his family. So he actually kind of deserted his family and is estranged from them. Wendell, did not has not said anything to his family and won't won't come out to them so they are both closeted gay in the time after world war ii frank has a taxidermy shop and wendell wendell starts kind of hanging around the shop and they form a friendship which eventually turns into love now the book follows them throughout time into they're both in their 80s so it flashes back into their the beginning of their relationship and when they're young and it keeps going back and forth between then and when both men are in their 80s. Uh, Wendell suffers a stroke. Frank finds him out in the garden and it details their lives after Wendell comes home from the hospital and Frank is now his full-time caretaker. I, I really love this book. I thought it was a beautiful love story. It talks about the aging process and um, a relationship that evolves from being madly in love as young people and committing your lives to each other and how that how that plays out, how that develops. 
um, when they realize they love each other, they want to spend their lives together, they end up looking for a house out in the middle of nowhere with incredible privacy. They end up planting trees that block out many of the views to their house because they it's illegal for them to be gay and to be with each other. So they believe they have to hide from society. So they find this house, they, they renovate it, they plant big trees, um, they create their own sanctuary. There's also, um, they love animals, they love dogs, they have a, a string of, of dogs as pets. And the one thing that bothered me about the book is the description of Frank's taxidermy. It gets pretty gruesome. And there's an, um, there's an event further on in the book that it, it's, it's almost, I had to skim through it. It was almost, I was almost too sensitive to the, the whole description. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But if you have issues with things happening to animals and either or that or a vegan or a vegetarian, this might not be the book for you because it gets pretty graphic. Other than that, it was a beautiful love story and it was a beautiful portrait of a relationship. Next book I read was Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay. I felt a little bit cheated because... <laughs> Um, I was really eager to read something by Roxane Gay, and I have several of her other books that she has edited or contributed to. This is an essay collection, and I assumed, based on the description and the title, that it was going to be essays about feminism, her feminism. Um, and it was to a point, but it was mostly a book about her take on pop culture. And she talks about really liking the Sweet Valley High books. Um, she talks about those characters quite a bit. She talks about movies and TV and different books that she's read. She describes herself as a bad feminist because she actually enjoys a lot of aspects of pop culture that are truly anti-feminist. And so the collection of essays, they're kind of all over the place. And it's a collection from her blog, from articles that she's written. It was okay, but I was, I felt like I was a little bit deceived by the topic. And so I didn't enjoy it as much as I was hoping I would. Um, the next one was a really great book. This is a, um, a young reader book and it's the Stonewall Riots written by Gail E. Pittman, who is um, an LGBTQ historian and a teacher, I believe. But this is a book written for young readers and it has it's, all, it's set up like a museum. So there's pictures, um, there's photographs, there are pictures of different things that some of the protesters, there's another photograph. Um, there's different um, items that you would that you would find in a museum. And there's pictures of documents. Um, it tells the story of the Stonewall riots and in New York and how that began. There's a, there's a short history of the state of um, life for homosexual people. And this was, this was long before kind of the LGBT, the T part and the Q part of the LGBTQ acronym came into existence. It talks about um, being gay during the times when it was illegal. It talks about um, gay clubs and bars being raided. Uh, different um, now historical famous characters, people who led into um, protesting and demonstration and activism. This was a great book and it was especially good that for a book to recommend to young readers. My daughter is 12 to 13 and I would definitely have her read this if she was interested in learning more about this. Um, really good. And it's almost it's almost if you are an adult and un, basically unfamiliar with what happened at Stonewall, it's a great introduction and a great primer to pick up. The next book, um, this was, this book kind of changed me and there was so much to digest and contemplate. This was a five-star read for me, and this is Amateur by Thomas Page McBee. The subtitle is A Reckoning with Gender, Identity, and Masculinity. Thomas Page McBee is a transgender man who was the first transgender man to fight a boxing match at Madison Square Garden. 
it was a charity match, but he was the first one to train with boxing professionals and um, being given a bout of boxing at Madison Square Garden. And I went through the book. It's not a very long book, but I went through it with a highlighter. And I highlighted on so many pages. There was so much here, not just to learn, but to really digest and think about. He's talking about toxic masculinity and the, the origins of how men believe they're supposed to be men and why that means fighting and violence and rage and, um, you know, bullying and why a man would challenge another man to a physical fight. And he, he describes an incident where he's with his girlfriend and they there's a new restaurant in their neighborhood and he goes out and he's going to go and pick up food and he's taking a picture on the sidewalk of the, the front of the restaurant and, uh, and a drunk man comes up to him and thinks, accuses him of taking a picture of his car and almost starts a physical altercation. And he writes about that, talking about what in the world would cause another man to want to have a fight with a man on the street. Of course, there's alcohol involved and that type of thing. But I just wanted to read a couple of passages that in the very beginning of the book that I highlighted right away, and it kind of almost set a tone for the what he was looking to, to do and point out in his observations and his experience with toxic masculinity, especially in a boxing gym and working with boxing trainers and other boxers who did not know until his actual fight at Madison Square Garden that he was a transgender man. And there was another young boxer who one day he was changing in the locker room and the, this other young man saw his chest scars from having top surgery and said, and it said basically, man, what happened to you? And instead of actually revealing that he was transgendered, he told him that he was, he suffered some sort of car accident and had to have surgery, but he did not reveal, or it was revealed about a week prior to his coach who did not tell him, I know, and he didn't, he didn't come out with his transgender status until he sat down for an art, sat down with for an article and came out publicly about a week later to his coach who already knew. So that was a really interesting dynamic. But one of the things that he says, he writes early in the book, the rules that newly defined my life were not futuristic. Do not let yourself be dominated. Do not apologize when you are the one inconvenienced. Do not make your body smaller. Do not smile at strangers. Do not show weakness. And he's been given advice on how to not act like a woman. And I thought, wow, that's really striking because to be given advice to how not to act like a woman, but to act like a man instead, um, really that it sets the tone for the entire book because between describing his boxing training and fighting, physically fighting other men, he talks about the differences that the stark differences that he observes between being treated as a woman and being treated as a man and how that actually leads into how he acts as a man and how he goes on to treat women. It, he also writes, becoming men had, had brought up the same question for both of us, the central worry of all sons of bad dads, how to be a man without being like our father. It had never occurred to me until I became a man that my brother had felt trapped in his body as I had in mine. And it's just, I, he, he also describes not knowing his biological father until later. Um, and that was kind of, that was a journey for him. Um, it was so, I, I was struck by this book in so many, so many places. And one of the last things he says further, almost at the end of the book, he says, this was the root of my personal crisis of masculinity, I realized. A part of me feared still, no matter how dumb and toxic I knew it was, that I wasn't real enough. He talks about interacting with women on the job. He's a journalist. He talks about how he eventually consistently notices how women are talked over, how women are ignored, how their ideas are listened to, but completely disregarded. And he makes a he makes a um, decision that he's going to be acutely aware of that in his own behavior and try very hard not to do that. It was so poignant of a book. 
and just reading his story and reading his take on toxic masculinity and, and his experiences as, as a transgender man, um, absolutely wonderful. The last one I read that, and this is a book that really made me smile, is George by Alex Gino. Alex Gino is a non-binary author. And the story of George is about a little girl who's born into the body of a little boy. And his, his original, her original name, excuse me, is George. Um, she wants to be called Melissa, but is not yet out to her family. She's only 10 years old. And Melissa in the body of George only wants to play Charlotte in the fourth grade play of Charlotte's Web, but the school and the teacher tells her that it's a girl's part and boys don't play girls' parts. It, it discusses um, Melissa, who's still called George at the time, coming out to her best friend and the best friend accepts her wholeheartedly and this is her journey to secretly, they secretly plan out Melissa um, breaking into the role as Charlotte during the play, during the intermission halfway through. Melissa secretly takes over the role of Charlotte and is a huge success. And the reason it made me smile so much is it, it gets to the point where Melissa has told her mother and her older brother um, that she is a girl. And her mother has more of a problem accepting this information. And it, it takes, it's a process for her and it takes a little bit of time for her to accept that she has a daughter and not two sons. In the very end of the book, um, Melissa gets a little bit in trouble for taking over the role of Charlotte during the play, but the principal is the one who commends her and tells her what a beautiful job she did and that she's accepted and she will go forward and be able to play the parts that she wants to play and ha express herself the way she needs to express herself. At the end of the book, she goes to her best friend's house and her best friend's uncle is going to take them, the two of them, to the zoo. But the uncle has never met Melissa before, so she's allowed to dress in some of her friend's borrowed clothes. And they, are, they the uncle brings two little girls to the zoo and it's so sweet. And such a great book. My my middle schooler actually gave me this book to read and said, Mom, this will make you cry. <laughs> it did. It made me choke up a little bit because of how wonderful the ending was. Um, so this was a great book and a great middle grade reader. Those are the books I finished in June for Pride Month. Um, thanks so much for watching the video. Again, take the time to look at the links that I'm going to post in the description box. And, you know, along with a lot of the other political issues that we're learning more about now with Black Lives Matter and with the status of black people in the United, Sa the United States and more of that history, I also want to look at LGBTQ issues and be an ally to that community and be a support and an encourager. So if you can look at the links below, check out a few of them and uh, see what you think. Thanks so much for watching. Write a comment to me below. I'd love to talk about some of the stuff and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.